Okay, aloha everybody. Thank you guys all for joining us for our Hanama, weekly Hanama Talks presented by the University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program's Hanama Bay Education Program. Um, for Thursday, um, July 20, uh, July 16th, excuse me, um, I will, I, I'm hosting um, uh, Julia Hartle and she'll be talking about impacts of shark viewing ecotourism on the ecology of coastal sharks in Hawaii. So without further ado, Julia. Awesome, thanks for having me, Gavin. Um, all right, I'm gonna jump right in. Um, as you introduced, my name is Julia Hartle and I'm a master's candidate in the Marine Biology grad program at the University of Hawaii and in association with the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. Uh, my part, my project as we started the impacts of shark viewing ecotourism on the coastal sharks in Hawaii. Uh, we're looking at the Galapagensis, so Galapagos shark here on the left, and on the right is Cucumbius, it's gonna be your sandbar shark. Uh, these are actually two of the most commonly encountered species of nearshore shark in the state of Hawaii. Now the Galapagos on top and the sandbar down below, they're distinguishable from the surface. Um, they're overlapping species who inhabit the same range by varying their diet and specific niche. For example, um, you can see them at the same time or on the same tour, but they tend to carry an inverse relationship. So the more Galapagos you're seeing, generally you're going to see fewer sandbars and vice versa. Um, now, according to old catch data from the marine environment around Oahu, the Galapagos shark um, is actually highest in concentration on this island. Um, their preferential habitat space would be longshore currents, so generally on the North Shore and the South Shore. And we carry this species in all stages of life, so juvenile and adult, male and female, um, we've got them all. Now as far as shark ecotourism, it's essentially where customers pay to observe sharks in their natural habitats. Um, it's a non-extractive alternative to fishing. Fishy, fishing or fisheries, um, and it's become a global phenomenon. So generating hundreds of millions of dollars every year and directly employing over 10,000 jobs. Um, as a growing industry, it carries a capacity to raise awareness. Um, unfortunately, one in four shark species have an elevated risk of extinction due to overfishing and other anthropogenic pressures. Um, but the impact of this growing industry, well, on shark movements and local abundance, those effects are still unknown. Um, so these activities typically involve provisioning to attract sharks, leading to unresolved questions about the influences on the movements, but also energy expenditure. Um, it could also change natural behavior, interfere with migrations, and there are implications for negative interactions with humans, say, on a tour or among these sites. Um, also the sustainability of shark ecotourism operations, it could be undermined if the volume of these activities becomes too large. Um, therefore, in this figure here, we're looking at uh, different colors of little shark emojis and the different colors represent different operators and each little emoji represents a public mooring. Um, those two circles are marking the first operators in the state. And if you compare those circles to the number of shark emojis or active mooring sites, um, you're looking at a five-fold increase over the past decade. Um, also, the number of permit holders, moorings, and consecutive operations are currently unregulated in the state of Hawaii. Now, contemporary data collected at these tour sites um, it actually suggests that migration patterns are not being interfered, but we are seeing a change in numbers. Um, and this is also supported by abundance and seasonal cycles in baseline catch data before the tours even began. Um, the figure on the left here, we're looking at the consistent mean over five years. So from 2004 to 2008. Um, and you can even see that that consistent mean not only across these years, but across these seasonal uh, changes. So each of those little letters down there is actually a different month. Um, and this is actually the mean number of all sharks. So not just Galapagos and sandbar sharks, but a couple of tigers in there as well. Now the figure on the right, um, we're looking at trends in abundance and it's pretty clear. The number of Galapagos shark 
is increasing, the number of sandbar shark is decreasing. Um, and this phase shift it actually reveals a dominance hierarchy where the larger Galapagos sharks are actually outcompeting the sandbar sharks. Um, so for the same space or proximity to vessels, for example. Um, but therefore we can come, we can say with confidence that the Galapagos shark is a numerically dominant species among Hawaii shark ecotourism. Now my tagging and telemetry research will provide important new insight into the overall movement patterns and habitat use of Galapagos and sandbar sharks around Oahu. So in this video, we actually see quite a few sandbars, but there is a galop in the beginning. Um, there is a couple coming around the corner. You can play back at your leisure, but there are both species. Um, and part of my main goals are going to be to elucidate how shark populations are responding to a growing number of ecotourism operations by comparing the historical and contemporary movements and the residen residency of sharks associated with these sites. I will reveal whether uh, interacting with ecotourism operations is energetically expensive for sharks and also advance the use of mark recapture models, which I'll explain in a, one of the next slides here, for estimating insular population sizes of coastal sharks. These efforts will lead to a better understanding of the ecological impacts and the carrying capacities of shark ecotourism operations. Now, shark handling and tagging activities will be carried out in accordance with the animal use protocols established by the University of Hawaii using field techniques refined over 25 years of shark research at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. Um, essentially, each shark is fished, measured, and sexed. So you start with a, a soft tape measure, and you can look from the snout to that first measurement. We start as the PCL, or the precaudal length, and we're going to that pit right before the tail. Um, there, after that, it's a lot easier to take that soft tape measure and actually add the difference from the PCL to the FL, which is your fork length in between the, the break in the tail, um, and also to get the total length, which would be the entirety of the upper lobe, so all the way to the end of the tail. Um, but we also are looking at uh, maturity in these species. So this is a male Galapagos, this little inset picture. Um, he is fully mature, his claspers are rigid, and therefore he can positively um, contribute to the gene pool. Um, but we also measure those from top of the urogenital opening down to the edge and from the pelvic fin also to the tip of the claspar. Um, I'm also going to introduce the two types of tags we work with. So on top the spaghetti or ID marker tags, and below the shark there is the acoustic transmitter. So the spaghetti tag is going to be a numbered marker that's placed alongside the dorsal for easy identification from the surface. Um, and you can also have 100% positive identification in the event of a recapture. Um, it was just that tiny little puncture to get it into the muscle tissue and we want to hit the centrotrichia so that it actually toggles on a triaxial mo motion with the natural movement of the shark. So kind of forward, backward, up and down, side to side, if you will. Um, these are also sanitized tags, so they do discourage biofoul, um, anything from growing on the tag um, or the wound closes around it. Now this is a closer picture of those spaghetti tags, that little toggle on the bottom penetrates the skin. Um, and the reason that we use these for our identification purpose is kind of explained in this overset image. So basically um, we count the number of tags over time. And if you look in that first picture, the fish that are captured and marked, they're released. And therefore on your next sampling and further samplings, you have a higher chance of grabbing one of those tagged individuals. Um, and it, can with a little bit of statistics help us get a more clear population estimate uh, when we're working with a closed population of sharks. Um, but we're also using those internal acoustic transmitters for the lucky ones. And so they're actually implanted um, in the thinnest portion of the muscle wall for easy access to the body cavity um, and for two main goals. So how often tagged sharks 
visit ecotourism sites, how much time they spend there, and how many different sites they visit, but also where these tagged sharks go when they're not associated with the sites and whether they are still participating in the predictable seasonal migrations. Um, so it's actually a pretty minor surgery that we do and they do really well. These animals are used to a rugged lifestyle and we treat them quite nicely because we like them and they're part of our research team, if you will. So there's a happy little sandbar, some tail wiggles. Moving back down to the blue. Um, and the way that we use those acoustic transmitters is they kind of beep at us within range of these acoustic receivers. Um, and the VEMCO receivers provide valuable capacity to monitor island connectivity beyond the ecotourism sites. Um, and it gives us a broader spatial context for interpreting the scale and movement of these animals. Um, and this methodology was also used to quantify shark movements in the same area from 2007 to 2009 data set. And this enables our historical comparison. Um, but also if you look at this larger figure, you're looking at a bunch of different colored dots. And the red dots are already existing um, monitor or monitoring receivers within our array. And the yellow ones are projected um, part of other projects within the fish lab whereas the white dots up there on the North Shore of Oahu are the ones specifically associated with this project. Um, and therefore, my study will fill key knowledge gaps by addressing both fundamental and applied questions about shark ecology. Because in fact, we know almost nothing about the spatial geology of Galapagos and sandbar sharks in Hawaii, despite these being common coastal species, and the most abundant species of shark at ecotourism sites. That was a little tooth catch right there. Um, so my aim is gonna be to facilitate fact-based management um, of marine resources with conservation benefits, stemming from a better understanding of the overall ecology of Hawaii coastal sharks, um, or more specifically, how ecotourism can alter natural ecology. Um, one of the things we're working on in the the next coming year, since we've already tagged a number of these guys, um, is to get our ultrasound machine up and running. So not just looking at the maturity in the males, but also the presence and absence of pups um, at the females. So we're basically working on funding for some really cool IMV goggles to allow us to use, use that machine in the field where it's real bright and sunny. Um, but we also hope to equip some of these guys with camera accelerometer devices to quantify their fine scale behavior, habitat use, and energy budgets. Now appropriate species management strategies, they really must consider anthropogenic, but also biological, ecological, and evolutionary factors to achieve long-term long -term sustainability. Um, and these are species dependent. With this work, I hope to enhance awareness of the marine environment and encourage interest in STEM careers. Um, and I want to say thank you to our contributing operators, my team and advisors, um, my family for supporting my work, and thank you for dropping by. Um, if you have more questions, you can contact me. My email is hartljul at hawaii.edu.